in our society now is is perfectly okay and available to each and every one of us to be successful at what we do, especially as artists. Okay, and I've gone I've gone through a lot of the different phases in my career, uh, working in corporate America and going into uh, a street artist, I know how it is to be a street artist and not knowing where your next uh, payment or next sale is going to come and try to live, create a budget <laughs> based on that. And then there was the, the time when we, we sought out people in authority and they were there. Okay. And that's when, uh, that, that's what we, me and uh, uh, Poncho Brown is going to enlighten you guys on how we're trying to recreate that environment for the multitude of artists who just can't seem to understand how they got the talent, they got the ability, but they can't see, they can't make that connection to something that they want to do for the rest of their life and, and do it in a way where they're fulfilled financially. And we're going to take, tell you things about other things that you have to make sure that you consider because you're not going to be young all your life. So there's ways that you can also invest in your own future in terms of uh, your retirement. You know, people, the artists don't know it's a simple thing to develop a retirement plan for yourself. Most times, a lot of times, in, over the last 30, 40 years, I've had friends that have literally died penniless. Talented artists in their own rights. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you a story about one artist, I'm not gonna mention any names, but he was found in his studio. He was there for four days before they found him. Body so decomposed, they had, they had to cremate him. Okay, they, his son, had the chore, the chore of trying to trying to pay for a funeral, and he couldn't. He couldn't. He had friends like myself that had some of his artwork that they haven't paid for it yet, and we dug in our pockets and paid for all it. Then we went out finding other clients that owed him money. We find out we finally how had a funeral in somebody's backyard. Okay, but. A lot of people came out and paid homage to this artist. He was a great artist. He was one of those artists that Paul Jones mentioned when I was over at Paul Jones' house. If you, if you're familiar with Paul Jones, you know Paul Jones. Uh, you're familiar with Paul Jones. He asked about this artist, okay? And the last time I, I found out about it, I was on my way to his house to give him information on Paul Jones, okay? And, and that's when I got the bad news. But he, that was, at that point, I got this whole idea. It says, why do we have to suffer for the sake of our art? We put our art out there and, and for all purposes instead of ourselves. It seemed like artists feel that they have to sacrifice their own personal well-being for the sake of their art. Okay? So with that, what we're going to try to, to explain today, and today only, is how this thing happened for us back in the 90s and how we have to recapture what we lost. Okay, so Pancho, you want to uh, lead off since you are the guest speaker today? Okay. Uh, a lot of artists now are trying to figure out how to connect the dots. Uh, in 1985 was really when this market blossomed. Uh, at that point, I think you saw the rise of about 3,000 galleries, 3,500 galleries around the period of time. There were a host of about 20 to 25 um, art publishers and distributors around that time. Uh, then we had uh, lots of community uh, venues that opened up, Baldwin Hill Show, uh, Culver City, the one she had in Culver City, you had the uh, uh, October Gallery Show in Philadelphia, you had the Cleveland Arts Festival happening, the National Black Arts Festival in Atlanta, uh, you had the Baltimore Arts Festival. So we had all these festivals showing up where artists had venues to go 
just selling the work. And I think that part important is because artists now don't understand the, the, the infrastructure that was there in the 80s between 80 and 2005. And a lot of artists thrive through that period. I mean, because in order to get into that environment, you have to be the best of the best to even get into that game. And so uh, that period of time was a very crucial time because, I mean, you named the who's who of artists, the Paul Goodnights, the Charles Bibbs, and myself, uh, you know, Kevin Williams, you talk about Barnett, you talk about, I mean, I could be here for an hour just give you the list of the heavy hitters that were around during that time that all gained their notoriety on that time. But now artists have disconnected from that history because most of that history was not documented what was going on. And so we're trying to go back now to at least explain to artists what was available, how that period changed and opened the door for everything that we're doing now. Now you can't talk about artist success without knowing what artists did during that period of life. And so one of the key things I think is that everybody had a work ethic with their particular work. I see that as being one of the divides today, is that most artists are not working enough, they're thinking too hard, they're looking at all the things that they're trying to assess how things fit, where is it? Back then, we had multitudes of work, so just having a venue was, it was a release for us to even be in that kind of environment. And so, we had to learn the business of art, and we all had a crash course in the business of art. And it wasn't like it was rocket science, but there were key players. Sell something to a distributor, and uh, naturally we all learned how to deal and groom ourselves to deal with retail clients. Uh, but that's the crucial part, is that back then there was an infrastructure and an art business that a lot of artists are not exposed to today. And so they're real confused. I mean, remember this was pre-internet, this was word of mouth. This was, and, 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 and just like when the Black Panther movie came out, there was that kind of buzz about African-American art because people were seeking out their culture. It was just like, it was, people were excited to come to the show and see all these representations of who we were, which was a very, very pop, a powerful time. Nowadays, artists have more of a social in, uh, connection to the work. So the work has evolved. Um, but the business of art is not discussed anymore because around 2005, when the economy crashed, 9-11 happened, we, were, we, we peaked real high from 85 to like 99. And 99, I think we started a descent and most of us didn't know that the descent was coming. Uh, technology was coming into place, all of us was thinking about getting a website. <laughs> but the plane was coming down. And by the time 9-11 hit, everything changed. Yeah. Shipping rates doubled. Mm -hmm. um, people got scared and held onto their wallets. They didn't know what was gonna be happening next. Mm -hmm. And then we went into that decline of the, in, uh, of the, uh, the, the, the country really with the, 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 oh, yeah. the car industry crashed, the housing industry crashed, mm -hmm. the financial industry crashed, and multitudes of other things. People lost their jobs, government jobs. It just went through this seismic shift and we watched Literally, 3,500 galleries plummet overnight. Overnight, they were just dropping like flies. So now, here it is, 2018. There may be less than 100. Less than 100. Wow. Less than 50, maybe. And when yeah. you start talking about distributors, where we had 25-ish, zero. Two. <laughs> yeah, it's it's probably no, it's probably no, closer to two, two, right. it's two it's or two. zero. <laughs> Depending on your perspective, but you know, they, if the you're looking at really African American like distributors, then that number depletes mm -hmm. because there's still a lot of other distributors that are distributing African American art that hold on to the last few mm -hmm. lines of what was available during that period. Mm -hmm. So that history is a powerful history if you're trying to, as an artist now, figure out what you're going to do. All right, you got disability. All your friends then got in your head, your family got in your head, you know you got something. You see people selling stuff. Mm -hmm. What's the connection between where I am to where that is? Mm -hmm. You gotta do research. We had we had the crash course. <laughs> we got pushed into the pool. <laughs> <laughs> and we had to learn. You was gonna sink or swim, and all of us swam. Yeah. You know. So it's basic economics. At this point, when we first started into this business, uh, technology had just done a major break in the 80s. 
where prior to that, artists had a very difficult time reproducing work, period. Uh, and now everybody has their full color print at home, and we have all these Epson printers now. We have, this technology has just zoomed forward. But in 80, 1980-85, that was probably the biggest revolution that happened to fall on the side of artists all over the country, really. Uh, because now we were able to go and reproduce works. Now, of course, we hear all these rules and regulations about what we could do if you were fine artists, don't reproduce, if you this, if you that. <laughs> This market really was a hybrid market that broke every rule there was. Um, before you had to be represented by somebody or signed with a gallery or, or a publisher, yeah. and he would sign you up and he would yeah. distribute your work. And Charles and I came along a time where we were the first artists published by Paloma Editions. Paloma Editions. Me, yeah. him, uh, Albert Fennell, yeah. Cynthia St. James, Cynthia St. James. Was, uh, Kenneth Gatewood Kenneth involved Gatewood, with that. Yes. They took a chance on publishing our work in the early 80s. And that, that kind of started a, 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 a storm because who else was with them? Uh, Keith Mallett was with them Keith already. Yeah. Under assumed name. So nobody knew he was African American. He was doing all <laughs> kinds of work. Okay. So suddenly here we are, we are the black ones yeah. in this group. And it was just an exciting time. We had Things Graphics and Fine Art mm -hmm. on the West Coast, I mean on the East Coast. They were publishing hordes of African American artists' work. I mean, they were pound for pound publishing more work than all of the other distributors who were taking it on as like, let's try it, see if we could get a piece of the action, more or less. Then you have Alba Vargas. Can you help me for a couple more? The lady in Atlanta. Uh, Essence. I, Essence. You Louise, Todd. Louise Todd. Louise Todd. Uh, 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 who, uh, Bruce Telekey. Bruce Telekey. Who was it? Viewpoint. And the people Viewpoint. Image Conscious. Of image image conscious. conscious. We had Ethnic Expressions. Ethnic Expression. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, it, was about, it was about 10 big ones. Mm -hmm. Right. And not that. Okay. Because of economic pressures. You're talking about the artists. Mm -hmm. the artists. No. We, the artists, and, well, we, when you talk to me, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dealer and publisher. Yeah, just my work well, happened to be mine. To yeah, that's what I'm talking about. All the he's basically is a publisher of his own work. I'm a publisher. Our, we had businesses. We set up businesses okay. that represented ourselves. Okay. okay. We hired people that worked with us mm -hmm. to do do what was necessary. But when we stopped, when I, when after those planes hit those buildings in New York and everybody got scared. It's so one thing that we have to understand about the business that we support. Buying art, and we, it took a long time to understand this. Why would something like a tragedy in our, in our society stop people from buying art? It's because they don't need it. Yeah. Okay, when people get scared, they, they, they go back into themselves and they only spend on things that are necessary to survive. Right. Art is not one of those commodities. I always tell people art is like buying a Mercedes when you only need a Volkswagen. You know, a car only gets you from point A to point B, but how you get there is prestige. You stick out your chest, okay? So art does the same thing. When you, when, you, when you have enough disposable income where you can buy art, okay, that's a big thing for, it, for everybody. It's, it took a long time to, for us to understand the psychology of buying art. There is a psychology to it, and you have to understand that psychology in order to do well. So you, you try, you're not looking for the average person on the street. You know, I wish we could, okay? You're looking for somebody that worked hard, and at the end of the, at the end of the week, they have enough money to take the kids out to a movie or to go buy a piece of artwork or buy a better car, okay? What, who are these people? Kind of middle class. Now, one of the things I want to get, out, get off my chest, okay, is why everybody left LA for other places, okay? I went and, I went and, I went and got the statistics. The first three cities on the most wealthiest cities of African Americans in the nation are here in LA. Okay, Baldwin Hills is one of them, and there's two other places. I got it all written down in my book, I'll bring it out later. Then all the cities from Atlanta to, to uh, Maryland follows. Okay, now you'll find all the 
uh, traveling shows, they're, they're going to those sites, mm -hmm. trying to capture those sales. Exactly. Nobody's coming to LA anymore. Despite the fact that we have the highest per capita, the average income for, for a family with a home in Los Angeles is $159,000 a year. Now that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but that's the perfect number for upper middle class. These are people that have disposable income. They have they have the ability to go out and buy art for for five or six thousand dollars. But there's happen. another piece of this that's very important. We're talking about the economical side, but we also got to talk about uh, the culture side of this. Uh, Eighty-five through two thousand and five, there was a consciousness that allowed people to appreciate art who never bought it before. So we keep talking about this. This, this five percent of people who have disposable income that buy art, but most of the people were they had never bought art before, mm -hmm. and um, and that was those are the people who we capitalize on the people that were entry level. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest piece that uh, they broke down with the infrastructure of the art business also was it was a cultural breakdown, because now those same people we're talking twenty five almost thirty years later, mm -hmm. uh, they have this similar jobs, they're making similar money, but they don't have the consciousness, the cultural consciousness that was available around that period of time. Mm -hmm. And so now we find ourselves in a position where there is a, a, a vast opening for re-education on that level. Mm -hmm. Also, what happened is that as we, uh, most artists got more and more successful and was moving up the ladder, they began to do certain things, like everybody moved towards where everybody were doing open edition posters which was a readily accessible thing for people to afford. You're talking $25 to $40, you could have a piece of art to go. And those people would buy for a while and then they would, they would learn about this limited edition thing. And so we all started doing limited editions. Most artists stopped doing entry level work. And then by the time 2005 rolled around, this digital revolution was getting ready to come in. So, I mean, we're talking about a lot of history that impacts on artists today when you ask the question, how do I sustain myself with my art? Publishing has been the answer. I, if you do, a, if an artist does 50 pieces, original pieces, how many pieces will those 50 pieces satisfy? Mm -hmm. 50. If they take those same 50 pieces and they do a, an addition of 100, they have expanded their reach. And so when we talk about this movement, we're really talking about this this concept of expanding your reach to people who are sensitized. That's a very powerful thing that goes so far beyond how do I sell my art. And artists had, we were forced to change our sensibilities. And now I see that opening where artists are so confused that we need to always understand that too. Doing your work is, the creator gave you this to keep you from going crazy. That's all. It was therapy. It was another voice, it was another way to express yourself, it was another way to, to, to record what's happening around you. That's all it was intended for from the beginning. Whether you came in 1995, 1895, that was what it's for. This business of art confused a lot of people because it was like artists didn't know what they were supposed to do and then they saw all these artists going this way and then some of them got famous and they were like, what am I doing? What should I be doing? What am I doing wrong? What am I missing? First, you gotta be doing the work and getting your what? Your therapy. And then when you start talking about doing business, you have to put on a different hat. Because most artists refuse to switch the hat. They feel guilty that they charge and they undervalue themselves. Everybody around them seems to know what they're supposed to be doing except for them. They're looking at these other artists and they're successful. Maybe I should imitate that. And it's this, 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 unreal world of expectation. Mm -hmm. Publishing your work expands your reach. Just that simple. I'm using the word publish so you can understand what it is. If you just say, I'm just duplicating my work, that's one thing. Call it what it is. We became publishers because of what was happening in the industry. We had to learn how to pr uh, produce our works, mass produce our works, mass distribute our works. And so that skill set gives you a freedom that caused a lot of enemies. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, there were a lot of distributors and publishers that did not want to deal with us because we, you know, we broke off, man. Look, why should I come to you? 
Give me, you gonna give me eight percent. I'm gonna sign a five pieces with you, and you gonna tell me what I can and can't do, and I can go straight to the press and make one hundred percent. And so we, they hated us. Don't buy me. He was probably hated probably more than most. But I know I was hated too. Because once you pull the control back to you, you have to be prepared to deal with whatever's going to come with that. I see a lot of artists now confused about, I'm not going to be a fine artist. I aspire for my work to be in a museum. And, and then part of the museum collection. And then hopefully at that point I will... <laughs> Explode into the what the hell are you talking about? Talking you about show me fame. five good references of that, and I will go for that. But if that's your 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 makeup and your psyche, you're gonna miss everything. And most artists are caught in between that and what they saw happening with this market because okay. most I, people I didn't see example. it happen. I give you an example of Ken D. Wiley. Absolutely, mm -hmm. he's an example. Mm -hmm. Ken D. Wiley. Ken D. Wiley. Or uh, Bradford, Mark Bradford. Mm -hmm. Okay, now these are black artists. Mark Bradford is selling sold it, sold a piece for ten million dollars. Wow. Uh, Kendi Wiley is selling works on an average of five hundred thousand dollars a hit. And now, so, Mamie Cheryl, who did the um, uh, um, Michelle Obama's portrait. Yeah. Her 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 life just exploded. She's a Baltimore artist. What, what's your point? What are you trying to say about them? As far as the point is, a, it's a it's a small niche, and for for young people to to go after that type of fame, yeah, it's probably it's just like uh, winning the lottery. Okay, that the system, the the art industry. When you get to Sotheby's and, and Christie's and the things that they're doing yeah. to sell art, okay, they've already got their picks of who's going to do that. To break into that, okay, it would take some extreme sacrifices to do that. I'm not saying that it's not possible, but I'm, I'm saying that we as artists that are in, in a venue of a hundred thousand other artists just like us trying to, to sell art to millions and millions of African Americans or other fields of, uh, of business, you have to think about it. You know, what level of success are you are you trying to reach? So okay. your point is that then you should probably self-publish rather than trying to wait and get into that museum or that big time gallery or whatever. Something you know, my choice like is you have to figure out what gang you belong to. Yeah. yeah. Because it's, it's really like, two different gangs. It's a choice. Two different ideas. Yeah, well, there's more than you, right? There's yeah. more than there's So there's a two. commercial <laughs> business, a commercial business yes. in the arts where, where we thrive in. Same. And then there's this fine art side of the business. Yeah. And the rules are different for each one. Yeah. Exactly. And, and you find people who are now navigating between the two. But right. if you're an artist and you you don't know which club you belong to, you at least need to do enough research to see who you are. All I'm saying is, the commercial market has been the market that has opened the door for a lot of the things that we see happening today. If it wasn't for the amount of art that was sold between 1985 and 2005, Marshall wouldn't have got his big hit. Basquiat and some of the other artists like Elizabeth Catlett, Jacob Lawrence, and all of them, we see some growth in that area, Romare Beard too. I give you a list of Paul, uh, 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 Charles White. They're now beginning to get some momentum in the direction of their peers because if you look at what they're getting in that fine art environment, it's still minimal compared to oh, the yeah. counterparts. Yeah. And, so, and my statement is that there is an entry level market of people that are being ignored. Uh, and, and they're just as plentiful as they were when, when all of these movements began. I just think it's a matter of focus. Um, for instance, we uh, now in, are in a digital revolution uh, in printing. So it's no, more, it's no longer about the offset printing anymore. It's about the G. Clay print. Mm -hmm. And so now we're all like crammed in that space. The ideology between having a offset lithograph print and a digital print is totally different. And so new artists are adapting to the digital revolution and they don't know anything about the offset revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, the digital revolution has all kinds of confines with it. The number one thing is that if you are doing G clay printing, mm -hmm. you have a solid partner that you don't even know exists. That means that every dollar that you make from those prints, there is a percentage of that sale that's going to that person. The machine, the Epson printer, the, extra, the, the inks, that whole structure of stuff that it takes to do that. 
the unit cost on an offset lithograph print has always been uh, two, three dollars a piece. You had to buy a thousand and minimally. Each clay printing now, I hear artists tell me they got a few for 35, but it's usually based on $125 for a 44 inch by 30 inch image. Mm -hmm. $125 over three. Mm -hmm. That is the biggest confusion that most artists are experiencing. If you're getting into publishing mm -hmm. and you're jumping into the digital part of it, you are now lost because you don't understand what the unit costs, how much you're making, how much you're investing to that solid investor. I don't care if you got a good guy down the street who can do them for you for $35. $35 over $3 is math, y'all. Come on now. <laughs> Another thing's happened is that technology-wise, offset printing has come down drastically in price. While we were all distracted, while we're being distracted by digital and G clay printing, mm -hmm. offset printing has gone down. For instance, in uh, 90, for me to run a thousand sheets that were 27 inches by 40 inches would cost me about 380 to $4 a sheet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Pancho has a new artist going to get a distribution channel for that. Listen, listen to me first. You're talking about distribution channels. You're not listening to the math. Okay. <laughs> and you're talking about the yeah. numbers that it takes to, 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 to move versus yeah. developing a client base that will improve your cash flow. If you are doing prints that's $35 and you can get $85 or $100 and you can do them one at a time, you have limitations that you wouldn't have if you just invested in certain pieces of your portfolio. I didn't say all of them, mm -hmm. but a good portion of them should be done at a rate that's affordable. Mm -hmm. And this is the thing that all artists are confused about now because I asked 20 artists, or how many G clays do you have? Oh, I got 15. Mm -hmm. What do you own a machine? No. Have you done offset? Oh, no, no, that costs too much. Not really. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but um, I'm sorry. Okay, what I'm saying, well, that's what I'm talking about. That's all together. Yeah. This whole discussion is how to empower yourself to get mm -hmm. to figure out what's happening in this market and how to redirect what you're doing in this yeah. market. Let me, let me everybody's iterate. from a different cross section. Let me business. iterate one thing about since you mentioned marketing, mm -hmm. and I want this is for the young, young artists that haven't got into this yet. Okay, most young artists get confused on the market, okay? The market is, is your market, individually. You don't, it won't be my market, it won't be Poncho's, it won't be Diane's, okay? But how, see, I have been able to, to nurture any clientele that likes my work. If, you don't, if they don't like my work, they just don't buy from me. But the thing is, you have to know where these people are and how to present your art to them, okay? And with social media today, it is so damn easy now, okay? Where you can cut and slice and find through demographics just the people that you need to show your work to, okay? And this is the thing that's going to make it possible for young artists to be successful, okay? One of the things when I go to shows, when I see a young artist displaying his work, the first thing I look for is a guest book, okay? Now, if he doesn't happen to have that, then I politely say, young man or young woman, let me give you some advice, okay? You are trying to sell your work to everybody, and the passive buyers that will, doesn't, not interested with your work, they keep going. Artists that, people that are interested in your work, they'll stop, and they'll stop and look. And you sit up there and you watch them look at your work and they notice that you're not interested in them interested in your work and they just move on. You have to engage them because when you shake somebody's hands and you look eye to eye and they, they admire your work, that they may not buy anything at the moment, but that is your potential sale for the future. Mm -hmm. So you have to have, there's only one thing that you need of that person is an email. You don't need their phone number, you don't need their address, address just an email, okay? And you start collecting them. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what the magic number is, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll understand this. It's a thousand, 
Okay? You have to hustle, get out there, show your work, and get a thousand people that love you. Now you can maneuver those thousand people any way you want. Can you imagine? That's why I get in trouble when I say galleries are not necessary for success. Because you, you can take those thousand people and show them one image, and that's like having a thousand people in a room this big, and you can't, you can't get a thousand people in this room. But you can get a thousand people on an e-blast to those people that know you, looked eye to eye, and they said that they love your work. You, sh you show that one piece. This woman right here, she can testify to that. Elaine will, will take an image. Now, our mailing list is not a thousand. Well, I ain't gonna even tell you how much it is. It's, it's up there, but she can. She the the odds of her selling one piece for five thousand dollars is pretty damn good because if you can get five or six thousand people in a room and they're all trying to bid on one piece, see, and that's something. That's what I'm trying to explain and tell young people the power that they have if they just use a little common sense because you're not trying. You're not competing with Diane Shannon. You're not competing with Maurice nor me. You're competing with yourself. Yeah. And there are people, there's enough people out there. We can't even sell to enough people. There's 35 million African Americans, if that's your market. Okay? How many, I have already did the studies on the demographics. How many are in the upper middle class? 37% of them. Now, is that enough of middle class buyers for all of us to enjoy? I, I, I guess you, but you can't rely on a gallery to find them for you because the first thing that if you go to a gallery, first thing they're going to ask you, can I have your mailing list? Why in the hell would you do that? You go into hymns so to, to help you sell your work. Okay, but in today's society, if you, if you keep watching the trends, you know, a guy like that operates Amazon, okay, they thought this guy was crazy. He had a he had a he had a ideal and now it's catching on like wildfire. Okay? People love the luxury, okay, and now there's more and more people moving into the upper middle class. More blacks are moving into the upper middle class. That means more what? Disposable income. Uh, but I wanna stop right there. Because we're, we're, at one moment we're talking about you as an individual artist, mm -hmm. and then the next minute we switch to the, the industry itself. And yeah. that's the confusion that artists experience. I want to get back to you, the artist. Mm -hmm. Your job is to build a following of supporters. Mm -hmm. Let's forget about the white noise and the other avenues. Mm -hmm. If you develop 200 clients, and you build a list of 200 people, and you feed those 200 people, I don't care if it's a print, how you gonna sell it? Or an original, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. To me, the two things don't matter. They're commodities, they're different commodities that are handled a different way. Uh, because she, as a young artist, can sell just as many offsets as we did back in the 80s. If she does it right, because the marketplace is totally different. Mm -hmm. We did word of mouth, now you got a, a group of, how many, how many friends you got on Facebook? <laughs> Oh, well, I mean, oh, well over 300 and something. Okay, okay. <laughs> then, if you said something to me about you, that means that you are a sheltered person. You don't have a lot of friends if you got 300 friends on Facebook in this day and age. Because all of them give you, I'm a bust you because that's what the confusion is. How many of you got on your Facebook page? A thousand. How many you got on yours? About 3,000. How many you got on yours, Mario? I have no idea. Don't worry about it. I'm just giving a poll. Yeah. Okay. We talking about my personal wood, right? Doesn't oh, matter. Yeah. <laughs> I gave you an option. Yeah. You said three hundred. Yeah, What's your probably, business page? My business page. Do you have a business page? I do have a business page. What's the number? I no, now that's worse. What's the number? <laughs> I opened it. Okay, but it's a baby. You're missing the point. See, it's I, less than a hundred. Okay, that is the problem. Yeah, I. No, listen to me. <laughs> listen to me. I'm not picking on you. I know. I know. But that's the issue that we're dealing with. Before we start talking about these markets over here. You got to look at what you're doing with your personal connections. Your art is a downline of people that are interested in what you do simplistically. Mm -hmm. Let's forget about the business. Let's forget about, if you look at the numbers of people that's following you, it's your, num it's your job to grow that number by any means necessary. Okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe I got a lot of snobs that don't, on that. say it again. I said maybe you should do something on that. Um, you know, 
the things they do on Facebook to... Well, I mean, but, but, but this is part of it. We start this conversation with background history. Mm -hmm. You're now speaking to me as a dealer and you're talking to me as an individual artist and I hear your question about how do I put more emphasis on my personal work because you already know how to sell everything. Mm -hmm. You have the same branding issues as she has. You have the yeah. same following issues as she has. Well, since you've been in the business from 1970 to now, you should be a beast with your oh, personal yes. work. And I know that you probably are gaining momentum in ways that they would never be able to understand. But the issues are the same. Yeah. How you brand your work how you produce your work and who that work goes to is just as crucial as how you manage all the other pieces that's in your repertoire. Mm -hmm. And even if you're running in like Najee Dorsey, he's doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. I remember when Najee came out, yeah, but right. Najee carefully nudged his work to be seen with the masters and is doing his own yes. work and his own shows yes. and he's used his magazine, his influence to grow his what? What's the word we his should be brand. saying? <laughs> following. Following. Oh, it's following. You have to yeah, build. Like, I got six thousand on my business. So, so what's your insight mm -hmm. on having the Proxy Life page and the, uh, the business page? You page. should have both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. because, because one has a limitation and one doesn't. The business page doesn't have a limitation. Doesn't have a limitation, and, and the first one does. So, yeah. but now the question becomes not so much whether you should have one or the other, but what you're doing on them. So yeah, if we got you at a picnic. <laughs> on your personal page, are you helping your art? No. Mm -hmm. At some point, both of them have to morph to be kind of business pages. For you to increase your what? Following. Following. <laughs> if you look at that number alone, you are already getting to more customers than any gallery dealer or anybody else could ever give you. Mm -hmm. She says, I had to go through gallery yet to show my, you don't have to. Because you've got a marketplace of people already willing. And are we talking about originals versus prints yet? No, no we're, we're not. And, I was, and, I was and, there, and there's a logical, there's a logical explanation for that too. And that market, where, where a lot of people think that that market is gone, it is not. It's not gone. It Still is. There. It is huge. absolutely there. It is huge, and the numbers will bear that out because you can't. You can't. One person. I mean, just a percentage, just a a very minute percentage of the amount of people that are looking for affordable art mm -hmm. would take care of you for a lifetime. And there's just not enough of us. Mm -hmm. to satisfy that market, but we turned our backs to it we because, because all the galleries in the local communities are closed mm -hmm. and those people and they're young people like, like you, mm -hmm. okay, even younger. Mm -hmm. they, they've got works from their parents. I, got call, I get calls from you all the time. What I mean is people, mm -hmm. people like you saying, mm -hmm. I just got this from my parents. My father just died and left me with all your work. How much is it worth? <laughs> Okay, so, but that's the new market, okay, and that's what we're trying to do right now. We're trying to figure out ways, and yeah. what, what we want to do is mm -hmm. find talented young artists, mm -hmm. just like distributors and dealers found us mm -hmm. back in the day, and expose them to that new generation, because mm -hmm. that generation ain't going to buy a whole lot of bibs, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. but they'll buy you. And, you know, and trying to empower artists to look at what tools are available to even be in the playing game to yeah. participate in this. Yeah. You can't do that with 10 G Clays. Mm -hmm. Not only if you not if you got a hundred people on Facebook. After a while you gotta have enough to feed your what? Following. Um, or and so you, you have to sit down and figure out how that's going to be. Am I endorsing everybody going and running to get offset lithography and doing large runs? No, I'm not endorsing that. But what I am saying is that you have an entry level market. You have people who have been buying your work for a while. You have folks that no longer buy your work, but they're saying your name. Mm -hmm. I, these people right here love them because they're the ones that have my work that have mentioned yeah, they're bragging to their friends that they got my work mm -hmm. which affects this market right. the entry level market is the one I'm probably not reaching but I know how to attack the entry level market because those are the ones that I run my offset lithographs for to that market because they're lower pieces lower edition pieces they can be open they can be limited but most of all they're affordable pieces right and you know, you know well, try, you're and, aging out, aren't they? The, say it again. The other ones are aging out anyway. The you know that market that you're talking about. They have the, already aged out. Yeah, most of them that we were feeding from seventy through not a two thousand, they all retirement age. <laughs> their walls have been full. 
and we still see them as customers, yes. but they're not really customers anymore. And then when we look at the downline of folks, we don't realize how detached we are from our who? Following. That's the key word, y'all. Get the edge. No, because once you develop that, that's when things begin to change. And I think that a lot of back to basics approaches need to be put back in place. Back to basics on how to distribute and publish mm -hmm. is wide open. There, there are no distributors. Yeah. A distributor simply means you're drawing a print in a tube and you're sticking it, a label on it and you're putting it in the mail, the UPS, US Mail or Federal Express. It's not a big machine that's running. That's what distribution is. Publishing means you decide what things are gonna go to be reproduced, whether it be offset, whether it be uh, G clays, whether it be etchings, whatever the hell you want to do that. So publishing and distribution, it's hard for us to not talk about how for you to satisfy your following wow. if you're not looking at the tools you're going to be using to get to that point. Because what happens if you're sitting at your easel and you're cranking stuff out and you're wondering how these things fit, you're not even in the game yet and you're not even setting yourself up to be in the game. Branding. Diane used that word earlier. We were just talking about last names and the, the, the issues that women have with changing names, but branding and rebranding yourself is crucial in this time. So, so I don't see artists that got their artwork signed five different ways. And oh, I asked them, well, why is it signed five different ways? Well, you know, I really had to figure it out. <laughs> figure out which one it's gonna be because life will get simpler right after that. <laughs> Your logos, what kind of logo are you using? What identity are you using? Now it's time to simplify all of that stuff. This is the housekeeping stuff. Have we talked about painting yet? I ain't gonna talk to y'all about painting. That's a very individual <laughs> thing for each one of you all. You all, it's enough talent in this room where all of us should be loaded. But if we're not sitting down looking at, okay, what is the climate now? What changes do we need to make? What adjustments do we need to make in order to be competitive, in order to be viable or relevant? then let's get it and break it down. First thing she said to me, I'm not picking on you, is that how are you going to distribute a thousand prints? That's a, that's a concern that anybody, we, we, look, you ain't going to never have the amount of prints that the two of us have in storage you. containers and on shelves. But the new entry level market is stimulated properly. You have a place for all of that work. What I don't want to endorse, if you're going to do it, See, I know people that do the G Clay and digital world, uh, world around very, very well. And not many people are doing it well. The bibs are doing it well. But they've invested in machines to do it. Not only can he print, Elaine can print. Chucky can print. <laughs> Elaine, you print. Everybody in the family can print. <laughs> they know how to do it. That is the best way to do it if you're going to do G Clay. But if you're an artist right now, and you, how many clays you got in your in your repertoire? None. No. How about you, Maurice? Uh, probably about oh, well, no, 20, 20. Okay. How many you have? I'm pretty sure I have none. And you have <laughs> personal work. We're going to leave hundreds. Your other hundreds. Yeah. That that's the disparity. But that's they're but they're, they're but they're small pieces. I don't that have matter. Ones. You have a marketplace for yours. So my my criticism for digital is not quite. But who is doing your printing? Not me. Right. So now, until you can sit down and tell me how much money is going to your silent investor, <laughs> because you got one, you just haven't seen it. Uh, let's see. Um, so you have okay. the luxury of marking it up to wherever you want to be and figuring yeah. out the dishes size and yada, 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 but you still have the silent partner. And even they have a silent partner. You know, with the inks and whatever. The inks, the papers, yeah. the system itself is the, the silent is. partner. Yeah. You don't believe me? Let the light yellow run out. Mm -hmm. You'll be scrounging around oh, like a crackhead. Yeah. You'll be scrounging around like a crackhead trying to find that light yellow so yeah. your machine will run because they calibrate the machine to shut off oh, when that color Lord. runs low. Mm -hmm. You have a solid partner. Understand mm -hmm. it. Figure out how to make it work for you. If you're saying you got 15, did you say 15? Who did them for you? He did them. Yeah. Yeah, so you 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 <laughs> lucky. you spoiled, don't even know you spoiled. Yeah, no, okay. I know I'm spoiled. Yeah, okay. <laughs> because that unit cost is really the same for everybody in that system. And so I want artists to become more in, more informed about the choices. If you have not, if you don't have two offsets. I have one. And, no, I have two. That's what I have, two offsets. And one of them is, 
I, still, I don't have any, I haven't reprinted, didn't have the, the poster I did for the uh, Pan African Film Festival. Yeah. Today, well, it's knowing what to I do. And I had another piece, but. Um, it's knowing what to print. Mm -hmm. See, when you do G Clay, you don't think about it. Yeah, you, you don't want to sell it. And you if you don't sell any of them, you know, as far as you're exactly. concerned, you sell it out. Oh, well. <laughs> right? So you can be a bad picker like you pick bad boyfriends when you pick the wrong image to print. Oh, yeah. So you got to sit down and really go, okay, what am I going to take to press? What situations am I going to? If you're going to, say, a Delta convention, you already didn't invest it, you already paid the licensing, and you go, that's a piece that you will publish offset because. You, were, you got thousands of women, potential buyers of that particular piece. You have to take that kind of risk on that quantity with that particular market. That's an example for you as to when do I use offset printing and when don't I use offset printing. Because you still need to cultivate those numbers. You would never be able to cultivate them with two G clays in your booth. I don't care if you take orders on them. You know, it's time to really go back to basics on how we approach that. Mm -hmm. And I, I want artists to be more empowered to investigate it because most artists are, are oblivious so to that basic process, which was the process that made that whole infrastructure run. Mm -hmm. And it's more affordable now than it's ever been. Yeah. Now, um, what uh, we want to go into now is probably a little question period. So if any, any of you have any specific questions you'd like to ask us, and uh, one thing I want, want to elaborate is on this, this process that we're doing now. By coming to Moreno Valley and putting this on, like I said, this is a work in progress. It's not perfect. We're trying to iron out all the, all the little quirks that we're, we're discovering now in, in doing this. Everything's going to be videotaped. But we may, next month, we may not be here in Moreno Valley. We could be in Los Angeles. After that, we could be in Atlanta, Georgia, or at Baltimore, Kansas City, doing the same thing we're doing here. But everything's going to be videotaped so that at any given time, you can go on the Art 2000 website or page, Facebook page, yeah. Facebook page and pick out the date and run this session. And YouTube. Yeah. Okay. So can I take a photograph and sure. post it so for me at this <laughs> yes. <this> event? <laughs> so while we're talking about that, I want to add a couple other things that we didn't discuss. The first thing is that we only touched on social networking. We touched on Facebook. Mm -hmm. But we did talk about Instagram. We did talk about YouTube. Mm -hmm. And to me, uh, those are two other entities that we all need to incorporate yeah. in our social network. Yeah. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time this last two years uh, developing content for my, my, my YouTube channel. Um, I think that everything you do about yourself feeds your what? Following. Your following. And you gotta think that way because sometimes we get onto the space about what we're gonna do, how we're gonna do it, I don't look good on camera, this, that, and the other, I don't, whatever. Content is king right now. Mm -hmm. Because that's why the 80s and what happened in the 80s we have to revive because nobody documented it. Now we're forced to deal with multimedia, video. <clears throat> this is a visual business. So, and um, you have to start looking at whatever tools are available to you and really use them. If you look at how you're using your Facebook and your Instagram now, there are many changes you can make. Like most people don't put the name, uh, what do you have to put in when you put for any show? Price, description, medium, type. Most of y'all don't do that on social network. You'll post the image, people like, 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 like. You don't even look like it's available. And so once we start changing how you make it available, I mean, you got uh, PayPal has a way you can come up with a PayPal code and you can mm -hmm. just put that there, there are links to the square. You can put all kinds of stuff to stimulate sales from Facebook. Not so much Instagram yet because Instagram doesn't have the links that you need to meet so people can click through. Yeah, but you can do it at Facebook. So it behooves you to learn those, I don't know what payment, all of us are using. We're talking about revolutions. Mm -hmm. Payment revolution is a big one. Yeah. Square, yeah. PayPal, we never had that. We had to have this big machine and <laughs> we'd take it outside to get a signal, you know. Carry it That's around. gone. We got a little chip in there. Yeah. You can go on your phone. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right. You know, so we have all these tools at our disposal now that we're so lost in the white noise of what, how to figure this thing out, but that we're not using the tools that's available to us, you know. 
And so I'm, I'm, I'm on board with Charles. And when he mm -hmm. looked at me and he said, hey, I want to do this mentorship program. I want you to come in and speak. Um, we're all, we've always been mentoring artists. Mm -hmm. I've mentored hundreds of artists over the years. But we need to share more information with one another. Oh, yeah. You have a vast amount of information, yeah. too. And we, help Diane, we, we do want to extend uh, yeah. an offer to you to come on um, air and uh, mentor mm -hmm. as well. Kenny Gatewood is going to be our featured speaker next next, next month, mm -hmm. and we're looking for people for the months following. You definitely have the qualification and the experience and and the respect in that, in our business. So, well, and ultimately, what we would like to see happen is that like questions that you guys have or problems that you have, and that we can start using our our new R two thousand page on Facebook. To, to put that information yeah. in so we can come up with some solutions to some of the questions. And, and believe me, the information that has not yet been filtered to you is enormous. Really? Enormous. And, but, but don't and, be stressed. And I tell you, but it's going it's to take, it's going to, when we talk about mentorship, this is a online mentorship, okay, where we bring in uh, talent to, to show you how this business operates to demystify it's going to take you you can you can't take what you what you digest in the first meeting and think you got all the answers to your future it's going to take at least a year or so okay and if you if you follow this because i nobody else is doing this but it's i guarantee you when others that i know see what we're doing here it's going to catch on because this is our way of giving back okay and what better way to give back is give it to people that, you, that you're trying to serve in terms of building a legacy for the next generation, okay? And I think that's profoundly more important than anything. I wanted to know, in your opinion, what is the differences between the offset and the decline or, or advantages? Which one has the most advantage? Okay, uh, he wants to know the advantages between offset and G clay. That there are there are two different animals, okay. first of all, and I don't think they really need to be compared against each other. Okay. Uh, offset lithography, to demystify it, is the is the common uh, reproduction reproduction method that artists have used for the last forty years. Okay, that's so what magazines have done, cards, everything you see is printed in full color has been done through offset printing. Okay, G clay printing is different because it's it's, it's a plotter based system. So there, there are no dot patterns. Uh, they're using uh, pigment dyes that are, uh, they're using much better ink. They're using better substrates. I mean, if you run on paper, you can run on canvas, you can run on whatever. So I just say that these are two, belt, two tools in your, in your, you don't compare a Phillips with a flathead, right, right, okay? Right, right. You gotta look at it like that. Each one of those techniques have their benefits. Uh, offset printing for one, the unit cost is lower. Um, you can get more color balance on an offset lithograph, but now that's changing quick on the digital side too. Uh, but while digital technology is impro improving, so is offset technology improving. So offset and so, is digital? Say it again. Is offset digital? Basically? No. 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 Okay. Offset is a uh, mixture of a photograph and a printing process. Oh, mm -hmm. So you got CNYK that runs through your home printer. Mm -hmm. They're running through a printing press. So all layers are going down there. There's more ink coverage on an offset lithograph print than there is on a G clay print though. Okay. Because when that, if that plotter comes across that paper, it's a very thin layer of ink okay. that's going on. That's why most people finish them or whatever. Uh, there is a different ink um, density on both. But the papers on the digital side you can do just about yeah. anything. A wider range of paper. So then you still have a good quality of, of brilliance with your, with your prints? Absolutely. Okay. Now you won't lose color brilliance in either one of those techniques now because of technology. Right. right. It's all based on how well you photograph your images. And okay. so if you're not really taking the time to document your images properly, give right. reproduction quality scans of your work, not JoJo shooting it because he's got a camera for you, yeah. okay. but take it to a place that can do a viable high resolution image, then both techniques will work fine for you. Now, the other thing is to be aware of, with an offset lithograph, you have to go to a lithographer to, to print them for you, and they have a minimum. It's not, it's not worth it to start up the, this big old machine if you just want one print. Oh, you can't do one print. Yeah, you can't do one. So, but, but, so, I, I but the changed, initial though. cost is a lot more expensive, even though the, the value 
is lower than a, than a uh, Jaclay in terms of quality of reproduction. To break that down in English terms, a printer will base their prices on a thousand sheets. Right. Okay, so you'll get a unit cost per thousand. Okay, so I can get 1,600 prints for about a thousand, I mean, a thousand prints for $1,600. That's how much per print? $1.60. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Play with it any way you want. Yeah. The mathematics line up on the offset side. Mm -hmm. Now, the good thing about it back in the day is that we had to run a thousand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I or more. In the, in or the more. <laughs> now, because of digital technology, they will run 300. They will right. run 500. So you now can get a quote for 300, 500, and a thousand. Because the price difference between the two is not that drastic. Okay. You talking thirteen hundred dollars on the on the three hundred yeah. side, and you talking sixteen hundred on the yeah. one thousand side. Yeah. I mean, literally, it's a couple seconds on that machine right. to go from three hundred to a thousand. Now, the other the other advantage between offsets and higher forms of reproduction is on an offset. If you run, say, a thousand, you've got warehouse space. You got stuff that you that's sitting there. Okay, that you you have to try to move. Okay, with a G-Clay or hand pulled situation, it's on demand. In other words, you only print when you sell something. That's different though. Okay. Not so much. Yeah, that's why I was explaining yeah, the only on G Only on uh, G-Clay technology. When you start right. talking about serography, that's a little different. Yes, serography is a little different. You yeah. still have to, uh, once you open up that serography program, if you're going to do a hundred you gonna you gonna print a hundred. You gonna run a hundred, yeah. right? Yeah, but if uh, but on the G Clay, what's the advantage? It's an extreme advantage that we've been taking advantage of because we got the machine in the house, and as soon as Elaine gets an order, she turns on the machine and prints it, and uh, that way you have no overflow of inventory that you have to concern yourself with. Well, it's not that simple. Just hit a button. <laughs> Well, I mean, she said it properly. I mean, it's still a learning curve. It's not like you're going to go buy an Epson machine, plug it into your computer at home, and then all your prints come out right. There's still a learning curve to make it go right, but still, you need to understand the tools in your tool belt. It's up to you to learn how to do that so that you can better maximize your sales to your following. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I'm advocating that most artists do invest in the machine, but I want you to be careful because I own the machine. I own one now because it's labor intensive. Mm -hmm. It's labor intensive until you get it right. There's overage. I mean, me and Charles, we had stacks quality, of trim off paper that. control is yeah. 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 Yep, exactly. If, if one splat comes out on the print, you got to rerun it. And your, your silent investment is paid regardless. <laughs> yeah, the average uh, cost of paper that we use, like they mentioned, there's several types of paper. The average cost is like $240 yeah. for, a roll, for a roll of paper. For a roll of paper. paper. Which might yield 15 to 20 prints. And each yeah. ink color would be like $100. $100 per cartridge. So and how many cartridges? Out, how many cartridges? Nine. It's up to nine. So when now. the yellow runs out, my machine won't go. Exactly. I have to go. Yeah. Now, nine times 100, keep track of that number now. Because we talked about offset printing, it has advantages. Yeah. Especially if you want to do things like cards. And, yeah. like, I, like when I gave you the measurement of that sheet 27 by 40 inches, you can gang a print and a couple cards and business cards and whatever on that sheet. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's the way I, I, when I do my publishing, I do everything together. Mm -hmm. You got a question? Yeah, I do. Um, one of my main questions is uh, like how you protect your work as far as like art law. Um, I had a situation where basically I kind of like I kind of split my art into two categories: fine art and then like fun art, which is the stuff that I knock out in two hours or less, right? Someone um, <clears throat> saw my work, I guess, through a friend and painted it, and they got called out on Instagram for copying my work, and then. <laughs> So that person eventually reached out to me and was like, oh, sorry, uh, no offense, apologies. And I'm like, no, it's fine, or whatever. They shout me out or whatever. But then they had the nerve a couple weeks later to ask me if they can put the work of mine that they basically copied on their Teespring account. And then they would split the profits with me. And I've already done like my research on these PODs. It's like, you can sell a bag, Teespring is gonna give you three bucks. Why would I split? <laughs> three dollars with you when I can put my own work on my own. I'm, I'm going to make this real easy for you. So how do you? He's going to have. That? He's going to have his assessment. I'm going to give you my assessment. Get over yourself. Mm -hmm. 
just get over yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't want to deal with the legalities of defending a copyright. Okay. I'm not saying you shouldn't, mm -hmm. but you don't even have a copyright application, so you can't even talk. I don't have a what? You don't have a copyright application filed with the Library of Congress for that image, so we're really not having a discussion. Well, how do you know that? I already know. I, I filed a copyright. What, you got a copyright? Where yes, I have the certificate of registration. Then I you got something to go with. I'm going to say this for you. <laughs> but, but still, you've got to be able to litigate that. Uh -huh. How much money you want I, to protect I, it? Okay, so I'm, I'm saying this. I'm just, I have you to. Have to uh, that's why I say get over yours. I'm not picking on you personally. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. It's just that I've gone through more copyright cases than most average artists. Yeah. I've been sued for $38,000 for my own work because I signed a bad contract. Oh but my now God. I can, the, the side effect is I can read a contract through the envelope. Okay. Okay? <laughs> but I think artists get so caught up in this beginning stage as an mm -hmm. emerging artist, you're mostly concerned about somebody stealing and misusing your work. Mm -hmm. And we have this confusion about originality. Mm -hmm. You got you're getting stuff from everywhere right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You borrow from here, you borrow from there. A photographer can probably come and bust you right now yep. because photographers <laughs> are now doing that. Yeah. I think we have to be uh, steadfast on how we protect that work, but we also need to back up. Mm -hmm. The online environment is it, it, is so crazy right now that you can make all kinds of copyright oriented mistakes. With people seeing your stuff right click and they want to use it as an image profile image and this it trickles down somebody sees it pulls it puts on a program cover you don't even know about it that is part of the business okay it is part of the business and after a while you'll get flattered by it yeah. and you'll wait you'll wait whether it's really a detriment to your forward movement yeah. and you make an assessment based on that because dealing with protecting copyright law is a very complicated yeah. thing Instead, instead of you doing that as a as a young artist just starting, mm -hmm. what we are trying to do is empower you by getting you into the system where somebody copywriting really means something. Is it really a danger to you? Right now, it's really not. No, it's okay, it's you're not. Gonna, it's not. It's not, matter of fact, it might do better for you than than worse. But is but once you. Uh, Established. I saw your eyes open up. Like, <laughs> what's, I mean, because we've had it. We've had it done when we just give Elaine would write a a, a letter of decease, cease and desist, and desist, uh -huh. and it's done. Mm -hmm. But rather than follow the lawsuit and try to try to sue somebody, it costs more oh. just to do that. Exactly. Yeah. But I said, but when you when you got a following like we do, where we we have to protect our reputation. Okay, so it's very critical for us when, when we find somebody violating our, our rights in terms of copyright, then we jump on it right away. Mm -hmm. And we, we have attorneys that we can resort to mm -hmm. to handle that for us. Yeah, and I okay. weigh wait the damage to decide what goes to the attorney and what's dealt with with yeah. me. Yeah. Because after a while, you got to weigh the assessment of it all. When he said, hey, look, sometimes it benefits you. If somebody bootlegs one of my pieces and people see it and it looks like my work, then what are people going to say? I got you. It looks like Poncho's work. Right. Or are they going to say, or they're going to confuse it for my work. Yeah. You just got to look at what, it's, it's one of the biggest things that emerging artists have to deal with yeah. is that issue of originality and whether somebody violates your image. You did something big already in that you say you filed a copyright application, yeah, but it's going to be literally impossible for you to copyright applicate everything that you have in your collection. Yeah, I was thinking, like, should I do this every six mm -hmm. months? How often you know, do I copyright? Only <laughs> when you're ready to mass produce. Exactly. Or if it's being published somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Can I just say something? Go ahead, Elaine. Go ahead. Okay. The artists always own the copyrights. Yeah. I mean, anyway. You do. Pre-50s, you own that copyright. When you file with the Library of Congress mm -hmm. your copyright for that image, nothing is there, okay? The only time that becomes very effective is if you have a legal case going on. Because the first thing the attorney is going to ask you is, it's just did you register the work? Exactly. I wanted to so, go the production and the um, decree. What would be suggestions in moving the production? Because printing 1,000, because for someone just starting out and expanding your following, one thousand anyway, it's a lot to get rid of. Then you mm -hmm. might not have to do a thousand first off. I just said the printers will allow you to do three hundred. Oh, okay. but the biggest now, thing is yeah. that you have to sit okay. down and now figure out what pieces are going to go offset. 
Uh, you should have some kind of indication of the following of the piece before you even consider that. Okay. And you also got to look at the fact of, well, if, you, you, if you're developing a new marketplace, you have to be able to feed them something. Mm -hmm. And it's an investment. It's an investment. Now you can take, uh, if, if, if you do a G-Clay right now, and it's costing you, let's just round it off to $100 a sheet, and you do a 100 edition, yeah. how much did that edition cost you, even if you're running one at a time? You the mathematician. Yeah. I mean, how much money is that? For one hundred dollars. If you sign a hundred on the bottom of that fraction, and it's gonna cost you one hundred dollars a sheet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How much money is that? Oh, uh, on the long one, ten thousand. Yeah. How many offset lithographs the rest of you want for ten thousand uh, dollars? Uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so even though that bottom number is just your number, yeah. nobody knows whether you sold the hundred or not. When you make that calibration for that bottom number, you still have to do the overall calculations and projections for that image. Okay. If you're doing it the right justice, or maybe you shouldn't have printed it at all. So whether it be 50, 25, or 100, do your math first, and then make a determination. Well, should I do a G clay because this is short term? Uh, is I, I got a, about a lot of people who've had reacted to this piece. Do I do it as a limited edition as an offset? You know, it's a lot of ways to look at it. But I think you got to study which pieces you take into production because you got several pieces, and I have several pieces that I will never reproduce. Right, right. I have my original market of things that I do. I have my reproductive works that I do, and there's a line between all of them. And all of them shouldn't be treated the same. It was uh, the Philadelphia Art Expo, their, yes. their book. You're done by Mercer okay, Red done Cross. by Mercer Red Cross. This book here, uh, this is out of publication. That is, that is probably the quintessential guide on that period of time. Yeah. It's a 500 page book on the shows that they did in Philadelphia mm -hmm. that ran for about 12 to 15 years. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. To the golden age. The golden, why, why age. Call it the golden age. Because that's when there was so much money generated, and and the, the whole concept of what happened has been forgotten. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to bring that reality back into focus. Because how can we move forward if we don't understand our past and know our past? And it was really the time when most artists became financially independent. Most artists made more money than ever made in their lives. Most artists had more opportunities available to them. Dealers made, most made money too. galleries. I mean, we talk about all the infrastructure that happened during that period. Um, was a, a, a period between 1985 and 2005. 2005. Through the Cosby era. Because a lot of it started from the, sh the pieces that were aired on the Cosby Show with Barnett Honeywood and uh, you know Brenda Joyce Smith and, and various other artists. But that period has been referenced as the golden age of African American art because of its impact on the art industry. 